This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This still is the day that the Lord has made. We have to rejoice and be glad in it. This is the Friday that Jesus shows. We have to be rejoicing and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, Lord. Let's rejoice together. Let's sing this.
trouble for this, but the Holy Spirit is in the room right now. I don't know what God has done for you, but I know what he's done for me. The sinner that I was, the sickness that I had, only God, only God sending his son to the cross that I may redeem forever. So I don't want to miss this moment where God is moving. I don't want, I don't know what's going on in your life today. I don't know what he's done for you, but you do. You know what this night means to you, that you will live in eternal glory, sinless with our Father. Daniel, let's do it one more time. I, I, I believe that God is in here and we can't miss this moment. Let's not rush tonight. We ain't got nowhere else to go nowhere but to only receive what God has done for us I'm so 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 grateful for what he's done for me can I say we, we, we put this here and we know this is there's blood running down from here where Jesus was and I keep looking at this spot there's a, you can't see it from here but there's this spot of blood that's running this way and I keep looking at it I'm like from where he did what he did his blood is making its way to the whole world it's leaving that spot and it's making its way over the doorposts it's leaving that spot and it's running straight to your infirmities it's leaving this spot and it's making its way and dripping to wherever you need a healing it's leaving this spot and it's dripping all the way to where you need it to run. Run on blood. Run on blood. Run on blood. I've got issues I need you to get to. Run on blood. I've got problems I need you to meet. Run on blood. Are you Lord God Almighty? for this day, Father. And we look forward to the resurrection, Father. The resurrection of life, peace, comfort, restoration, Father. We thank you for sending your son to die for us, Father. A sinless lamb, Father, to die for us, for all humanity, that we may live in eternal glory. 
So we thank you today, Father. We are gracious for all you're going to continue to do within our lives. The healing that is beginning to take place. The restoration within marriages and families and children, Father. The enemy has no say here, Father. The enemy has no say over our lives over our families, over our finances, over our depression, anxiety. We give it to you, Father. We give it all to you, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, Lord. We thank you for tonight in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen, church. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Before you are seated, wipe your eyes and your nose before you give your neighbor a hug, a high five. This is our Good Friday service. I don't know who invited you or who you may have came with, but we are excited that you are in the building with us today for this amazing night. I have a quick announcement for you. As you know, our Holy Week continues this Resurrection Sunday, and we don't want you to miss it. We have three services, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 1 p.m. We would love for you guys to come out and join us for one of those amazing services. As again, thank you guys so much for being with us here tonight on our Good Friday service. Let's prepare our hearts to see what's next inside the tomb. Common, because common Christianity, like the, especially charismatics, they just easily go to the low-hanging fruit perspective, in my opinion. That is, he's afraid. Peter denied Jesus because he's seen him brutally marred. He's seen him not be, he's seen him defeated. Yeah, well, you know, many theologians uh, believe that, obviously, what we do know is uh, Peter denies Jesus. And so uh, a young child says, you know, hey, you're one of his disciples after Jesus has been tried. And he's going through his trial period on Good Friday. And and Peter uses um, extreme, almost pretty much almost curse words. He cusses at this girl, and the community says, I don't know him. Uh, I'm not with him. I'm not one of his disciples. And many will say that, oh, that comes from a place of Fear. he he doesn't want to be the next guy on trial, wow. which that could be what that could be the case because the Bible doesn't tell us what what's the reason on why he's doing this. But if you just look at a few hours prior, what did Peter famously do when Judas turned Jesus in at the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, Peter famously pulled out his sword and he cut off a Roman soldier's ear. Jesus grabs it and he puts the ear, he heals this man. It's actually the last healing that's recorded in the Bible of Jesus, which is towards a Roman Gentile man. And he heals this man's ear. And he basically tells Peter, hey, this, this is not what we're doing right now. I didn't come for this right now. Wow. And so... You can imagine Peter's world is completely rocked because he thought, just like everyone else who's yelling Hosanna, mm. you know, four or five days earlier, uh, Peter's thinking the same thing. And so when the guards come, Peter says, game time. This is what we signed up for. I got a sword on me. Time to go to fight. And then he looks at the guy he's been following for three years. And not only is he not uh, fighting with him, he's healing, healing the very the enemy. people he hates. Wow. You know? So you fast forward a couple hours later and he's watching this trial and somebody recognizes him, more than likely he's angry at Jesus that Jesus didn't live up to the expectation that Peter had of Jesus. Hmm. And I think that's where a lot of all of us get is we think that Jesus is supposed to live to a certain expectation of our standard or what we want him to do rather than what the truth is of what Jesus came to do for us. And so Peter more than likely is very upset that this is not the guy that I signed up to follow. Wow. He's denying Jesus, not because he's scared he'll be next, but because I came here to fight. I came here to be a war, in war. Uh, James and John, same thing. The mother says, hey, in your palace here on earth, can my son sit on your left and right? And Jesus talks about the kingdom of mm. God. The disciples consistently thought, 
Jesus, his first thing he was going to do was set up a physical kingdom, which Jesus says, that's not what I came here to do. I, I, I came to set up uh, the kingdom of heaven first, and one day I will return and we'll set up that physical kingdom. And so um, they didn't know the time proximities that Jesus was speaking. And so instead of acting on faith, they act on their own desires. They acted on what they wanted to be true, which were for Peter, which was wartime. That's what Peter wanted. And when Jesus said, hey, no, we're not doing that, and we're going to love our enemy as ourselves, that's where Peter more than likely was like, I didn't sign up for this. Because then when Jesus dies, what does Peter do? He goes back to fishing. Unfortunately, in certain given opportunities, like Peter, whether you think he denied Jesus out of fear or denied Jesus out of anger, regardless, it lacked faith. Will you lay down your life for me? I'd murk any man who steps to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. No, that's not possible. I know what I'm about. I am not the man I thought I was. I am troubled, angry. The regret is unbearable. I am a man of war. But I was afraid, weak. A coward. My spirit battles against my own flesh. Afraid I'd go through something so gruesome. <laughs> to die upon the cross like some convict a deserter, mutinous soldier. The barbaric nature of it all. I thought your mission was to lead Israel to freedom against Roman rule. A political messiah. An eye for an eye and an ear for an ear. I am so misunderstood, clouded by my own selfish agenda. I was ready for violence. But you came in peace. It doesn't matter why. Because this man of war became a punk. I stood for nothing when it mattered most. Just like the pig, Judas. He was unworthy to break bread with his brothers. He betrayed him. A 
I guess. So did I. I am no better than the pig. Maybe Jesus should have denied me. Grace. Salvation. I have disowned. He died for nothing. His hopes, my hopes, his dreams, my dreams, fulfillment of prophecy. His purpose, my purpose. It's done.
Till I die, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust. Can we pray together this Friday evening together? Let's uh, join in a moment of prayer. Uh, God, we thank you so much for your mercy, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace, God. That, Jesus, you would come on this planet, that you would live for 33 years, born to die. A lamb that would be slaughtered, not for worship to God, but sacrifice to us. God, I pray we never take it for granted. What's become a symbol 
of Christianity, the cross, was once the most grotesque system of death ever invented, God. Today, we wear crosses as signs of pride and signs of joy to say, I believe in Jesus. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, though you may believe in him, do you believe in what he did? And do you honor what he did? Because if so, that cross commands that we too die to self. That we too lay our life on that cross. Because Jesus' sacrifice was for all and is for all eternity. So God, I pray in this moment that we fix our gaze on the cross of Jesus. The most beautiful, wretched, disgusting form of punishment our king laid himself on there. And so we thank you, Lord, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. With the few moments I have with you all, I'd love to share about this Good Friday that can bring us closer to the cross this moment. Not just to Peter's denial, but what this day really means. For many of you guys, you may have celebrated this day for years. You may have grown up in church, and every uh, Good Friday you've been in church and you've celebrated it. There may be others in this room that this is your first Good Friday experience you've ever had in your life. No matter where at your faith, we will see what God has spoken to us thousands of years ago is still real today. And so if you join me in John chapter 19, I'm going to read a little bit of verse for us today to understand the last moments of Jesus on the cross. Uh, we could spend an entire year just studying Holy Week. It would be really easy to take a year and just study eight days. But for the sake of time, as we look at the moments that Jesus has where his last breath is on the horizon... That's where we'll read in John chapter 19, starting at verse 28. And if you don't have your Bible with you, I'll have it up on the screens. We can follow along. But if you have your Bible, you could turn to John chapter 17. And would you still do me the honor? And could we stand in honor of God's word today uh, as we read with one another? And we'll read about 10 verses together. Here's uh, what it says in John chapter 19. It says, after this, Jesus... Knowing all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since the day of preparation, and so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs uh, be broken and that they may be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of those who had been crucified with him. Well, why? If they were faking their death and took them down, they could have run away. And so breaking their legs doesn't let them go anywhere now. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, uh, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth that you may also believe. For these things took place that Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him who they have pierced. You may be seated. The great T.S. Eliot said this. He said, the dripping of blood is our only drink. The bloody flesh of Jesus is our only food. In spite of what we may think, that we are sound, substantial, flesh and blood, again, in spite of that, we call this Friday good. Today, as it's Good Friday, is meant for you and I that we fully rely on the work of Calvary, the work of the cross, for all of our substance, for everything that we need in life. For everything that we trust and hold dear, Jesus holds it on the cross. It's in his sacrifice that we find freedom. It's in his sacrifice that we find true peace because he died. And we know in a few days we will celebrate that the death was not all. 
But until that moment, for many of the disciples, most of them thought this was the end of their story. This was the end of a three-year journey. I want to share with you for a few moments. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but have you ever thought and noticed that truly it's one word that can really change your life? Oftentimes when we think of life-changing moments, uh, life-changing experiences, we often think that it's long, drawn-out moments, right? We, we, we think of long moments like, okay, when college is over, it's because I spent four years of all of this studying. Uh, many times we'll look to great speeches or sermons or politicians to do something incredible over four years and eight years. But when we really think about it, it's really through one word that we see life is usually altered. If you don't believe me, this word when it's spoken will change your life. If someone ever says, will you marry me? It's just one phrase, but it's pretty life-changing, right? Right? Same in that same theme, uh, when someone at the altar says, I do, it's pretty life-changing, right? Most people, some, some people spend a year, two, three years planning a wedding all for that one moment to say, I do. Just to say one word. Tens of thousands of dollars is spent to hear two people say one phrase, I do. But it changes things. In the same way, when you were first dating your spouse, if you're married, or maybe you've dated someone before, and the first time the word, I love you, was said, it means a lot. I know when I told my wife when we were dating, I love you, it took her three months to say it back. <laughs> so I remember that day vividly, because when I first said it, she said, uh-huh. And then finally, when she said it back, I said, oh, now we can move forward. <laughs> Everything for those 90 days felt like it was on pause until I heard her say it back. Just one word, just one little word. We often demean the value of one word. Maybe you've heard this before, you're hired. Wow, something I've been believing for, praying for. And maybe in that same sentence you met with HR, and maybe some of you have been blessed enough to hear, with this job comes full medical coverage. Wow. Matter of fact, how full is this coverage? You guys got, you got a paper that full medical? Or maybe you've gone out to lunch with someone, and by the end they said, hey, lunch is on me. I, I would have ordered completely different if I knew that <laughs> on the front end. Or maybe you've been at the checkout counter at a store, and then someone rings it up, and they go, hmm, your item happens to be half off. Oh, my goodness. I got to go back and look at, I got to do a circle one more time. <laughs> Changes everything. Or maybe you've been with your spouse before and believing God, and you've heard your wife come in and she says, I'm pregnant. For most, some said, oh, some said, yay. See, <laughs> I can see where your walk has been with Jesus. For future reference, you say yay at that point, okay? That's what that happens. But let's take a turn at other words that maybe don't mean so much, but it's still life-changing. How about sitting down with someone and they say, we need to talk. Oh, man. <laughs> Dating someone, they say, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> if you grew up and your parents said, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> oh, man. You have to go and say that. Sitting with someone, how about you're fired? Man. How about you're being evicted? How about, hey, man, I can't pay you back after all. Man, things are really about to change between you and I <laughs> real fast. One word, one phrase, about to change our whole relationship. What about this? This sickness is terminal. What about lastly, hey, I want a divorce. I want to share with you that the words of Jesus mattered when he said, it is finished. That one phrase, that one phrase, so many people hear it, 
So many people see it. We just read it in the scripture. And so many of us will look at the, when Jesus is beaten. We'll look at how he has bled. We'll look how they put a crown of thorns on his head. We'll look at everything. And then we just read him, him say out of his own words, it is finished. And we just go, oh, okay, it's nice. It's fin- what's finished? I don't know. I think the cross is finished. It's time. No, no, no. When he said it is finished, he said the work of salvation, the work of the cross This journey that God has been taking humanity, it is finished. That one phrase matters. It matters, and it changes our life. And the one phrase Peter spoke matters because it can often be you and I as we live life. That phrase that when three people recognized him, Peter said, I don't know him. That phrase mattered. Because not only was that Peter that spoke that that day, that's you and I out on the field. When someone's hurting, when someone's in pain, when someone needs forgiveness, when someone needs mercy, and by the very actions that we represent the goodness of God, it can say either we know him or we can reflect Peter in those moments and say, I don't know him. The cross was sufficient for me, but it's not sufficient for you. And so we have to recognize that by God's word and Jesus' phrase, it is finished. It's finished. And you got to remind yourself often, the work of Calvary, it finished some things. It finished everything that humanity needed to be brought into relationship with God. It was God's plan that was done. One word, one phrase. All of Jesus' ministry summed up in a few simple words. It's finished. Something you and I can hold dear this Good Friday. And I want to encourage you in the future church, Revelations 12, 11 says this. This is the beauty of Jesus. And as one day we'll be in heaven with Christ. Revelations 12, 11 says this. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. The blood of Jesus. What? This moment right here. The finished work. It says they. Who? You and I. We can conquer Satan. We can conquer death. Why? By the blood of of the lamb and why else by the word of your testimony your testimony will you make the phrase it is finished personal to give you a testimony because you can conquer Satan and death by what the blood of Jesus and making the work of cross your testimony it says we conquer Satan by Jesus' work and also that you ascribe it to your life. So many people live in parallel realities and parallel lives where we recognize Jesus' work because we put a cross around our neck or we make the sign of a cross. We recognize that aspect, but we've never allowed it to be a testimony in our life. So we walk almost like in a freeway where you have one car in one area and one car in another area. When a car drives by and it's nice, guess what? It's not your car. So you could admire it all day. You could look at it all day. You could inspect it all day. But until the keys are yours, all you're doing is admiring it. Until Jesus' work becomes ours and we receive him, all we're doing with the cross is admiring it. But the work of the cross was meant to Make it personal to make it ours. And for God to give you a testimony. How does God win battles in life? It's very easy. Understand that the blood of Jesus is yours. And God has a story to tell in your life with this work. It's meant to make it personal for us. But so many times the gruesome work of the cross, we want everything when it comes to Jesus except this work. We want Resurrection Sunday Jesus. I don't want crucified Jesus. I don't want cross Jesus. Because Jesus told me to pick up and carry my cross. And I I don't like that part. I like the victory part. I like the part where we're glowing. I like the part where Jesus walks out of tomb. I like the part where there's two angels that are big bodybuilders nearby that are just shutting down Roman soldiers. Like, I, I like that part of the story. But you can't get to that part of the story unless you're willing to understand and accept this part of the story and receive 
his death for your life. You can't get to resurrection without death. And we can't get to resurrection without the death of ourselves. Leaving our old selves behind. That's why when so many people say, God loves me for me. No, if God loved you for you, you would be on a cross. God loves you for Jesus. Because you have received Jesus. That's why God loves you. Because you have accepted his son and the work of his son who died for you. That is why God loves you. That is why he accepts us and that's why he receives us. You know, oftentimes, uh, prior to this recent October, about twice a year, uh, I would take groups of people to Israel. And I normally would lead tours. So I would take group of, groups of pastors to Israel, and I'd give them a tour of the Holy Land. And I would take our church members to Israel and take them a to tour on the Holy Land. What I started doing after a, a couple years was all, everybody wants to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. We all want to go to the place that Jesus prayed and Judas betrayed Jesus. And that, that place still exists today. And all of us, we want to go to that place. We want to honor Jesus. We want to go to the place that he was turned in. And we want to uh, uh, understand that that started an interrogation process that was unjust, that led to his death on the cross. And so all of us want to make that moment personal. We always also want to go where Jesus was resurrected, but that's where we celebrate. We thank Jesus. In the moment of Garden of Gethsemane, we really want to sit and just sit with Jesus' sacrifice. So I always take people. But what I started to do when I would go on tours and take groups was the first thing I would do, because at the bottom of the Garden of Gethsemane, it's all owned by old Orthodox churches that have existed for really the institution of the church. So you have Russian Orthodox Church, you have Egyptian Coptic Church, you have the Catholic Church. And so, and so all of them own the, the most pristine part of the, of the land. And, and, and they have priests that are like incredible gardeners. And so what I normally take people is the first thing that I do is I take them about 100 yards up and I take them where no church has developed anything. And it's just raw. And where it's raw, it's not really pretty. Like sometimes trash blows in, like sometimes you can see like a little kid's tricycle, like sometimes, it, it's just not, it's not kept, so, so no one gardens it, no one's really watered those olive trees, so some look good, some don't, and so I have a picture of, of the one that I normally take them to. So normally I take people to, to, to this spot, and normally, you know, they're, like you see, it's, it, it's very rocky and it's very hilly, and when I take people there and I read the passage of the Garden of Gethsemane, Everyone just always kind of stands there and they, and they just look at me. And, and, then I, and then I always tell them ahead of time, hey, we're going to take you to this spot and then I'm going to take you to another spot. And so I'll take them to this spot and they just look at me and I'll say, hey, do you guys, if you guys want to take a moment. And they all just kind of just kind of stand there and they look like, uh, you know, like, oh, is, is this it? And they just sit there. And they go, okay, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the gardens that, that the church is on. And so then I take them to the gardens of the, of the, that the church is on. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yes, I see it now. I see what you saw. I see it. Beautiful, pristine, 600-year-old olive trees, watered every day, prayer gardens and path. And now everyone starts going, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We see you. Oh, we see you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why is that? Because we like the pristine part of faith. We like the, and I always tell them, I'm going to take you to the spot so you can get your phones and you can post on Facebook that you've been there and you can show all your, and then all of a sudden when I take them to that garden, everyone pulls out their phone. No one had their phone out before. Nobody. Nobody wanted to take a picture of that junk, but now... Oh, Facebook, Instagram, people selfieing, you know, next to the guard. This is where he was, you know. Why? Because I identify with the perfect part of how this portrayed. Not the ugly, gruesome reality that Jesus' own mother didn't recognize him. Not the gruesome reality that he could barely breathe. And every time he had to take a breath, they would bend his legs so that he couldn't breathe because his ribs were in his stomach. And so he had to push on the nails just so he could take every breath at a time. If you were there in Jesus' day, that moment would not be a moment we'd be taking a picture of. 
It'd be a moment that we could barely rest our eyes on. That we could barely look at. And so many of us, we say to God, God, take me to the place that's manicured and pristine. Just like getting your nails done. Many girls, they don't want to be proposed to unless their nails are done. (laughs) But if you were to look at the work of Jesus, it would not be the right side. It'd be the left side. It would not be this pristine, perfect, beautiful thing. It would be rugged. It would be gruesome. And it would be for you and I. Whose hand would you hold in that picture? So many of us are looking for the perfected hands of life. When Jesus and the cross, the moment where we receive him, the moment where we come to him, it takes you taking your ugly self and saying, I don't don't want this anymore. I don't receive this anymore. Jesus died so that you and I could recognize our own sin and say, God, it is for you. Jesus bore it all on the cross. The blood gives us access with the few moments I have. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It says, knowing this, you were ransomed from futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things as such as, uh, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. You know, I, I often kind of, personally struggle with this verse, not because I don't accept it or receive it or understand, but I find myself struggling with this, not because I don't receive God's love, not because I don't want God's love. It's because I want to consistently believe that I'm entitled to receiving salvation on my own fruition. That verse is meant to struggle with, not because you don't want God's love. It's because are you willing for Jesus to pay your ransom by the cross and say you had nothing to do with it? You you can't get credit for this. In fact, we, we don't want no part of being involved in this. But Jesus encourages, says, will you carry your own cross? Will you have your own aspect Where you will say, God, I can't do what you did, but I can receive this work. And I can choose that one word, it is finished as my own. And I can receive that one word as my own. And if you receive Christ's blood, what does that do for our life? Well, then God can give you a testimony. In a simple way, if you don't know what a testimony is, a simple way of that is God's story of goodness in your life on how he redeemed you and every person that receives the cross is given this testimony as a gift of God and what he says in Revelations 12 it's by the word the the spoken word the boldness of you speaking what Christ has done that helps you overcome the work of the enemy God will give you a testimony How do I receive it? You receive Jesus by faith. You receive this work by faith. Trusting in God that that word it is finished is for you. It was even for Peter. Even when we see on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, even Peter was able to see that he wasn't sufficient to hold on to what Jesus did. But Peter still ran to Jesus when he heard he was resurrected. He didn't believe it at first, but when he saw Jesus... He believed. And he gave his life fully to the work of Jesus after that. Even to the point that Peter would be uh, crucified upside down on a cross by the Roman Emperor Nero. Peter would suffer some years later the same fate that Jesus did. The only thing is, is Jesus died unto humanity and Peter died unto Jesus. That was the difference. I think if many of us we're to follow Jesus if it, we are told that, you know, following Jesus may lead to death. I think a lot of us may say, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I want that part. I'll take the resurrected part, but I don't know if I want that part. But he gives us a testimony. First John chapter 5, 4 says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It's the testimony of your faith in Jesus. 
And in Jesus' last breath, he says, it is finished. I wonder what you and I would do. If you knew that it was going to be your last breath soon, what would you do with your last breath? What would you say with your last breath? How would you summarize your life if you knew it was going to be your last breath? You know, in March of 2020, my father-in-law went home to be with the Lord. And he had passed uh, due to cancer. And there was some time when my father-in-law, uh, the last periods of his life, uh, he was at home hospice care. So for about the last a little over a week and a couple weeks, um, he, he was at home for a little bit. And um, as he was laying in bed, many of us, all of his family would visit every day. And for about the last six days or so, uh, and even a little bit more, he, he had gotten to the point where he couldn't eat and chew on his own. And so uh, he, he had a tube that was feeding him his food. And, and um, for about five or six days, he had gotten to the point where he didn't move at all. He had just moved his eyes. And so as we'd come talk to him and say, hey, dad, and try to have some conversation, he could only respond to us with his eyes. So he'd raise his eyebrows or uh, give a wink or whatever that is. And that, that's how we would begin to share some last moments. Well, uh, about two days before he passed, he, he, he didn't move a muscle for five or six days. And so about two days before he passed, uh, my, my mother-in-law called Ashley because I was at work, and, and my mother-in-law said, hey, do you, could Adam come and give Dad communion, uh, final communion, in case one of these days he goes home to be with the Lord? We want him to honor Jesus and the work of Jesus on the cross. So my wife calls me, and I say, absolutely. Now, you got to remember now, for some days, he hadn't moved and he hadn't eaten at all. He would just move his eyes. So we're plan I'm planning in my head on my way, okay, if I go there, I got maybe we could put some, some wine or juice on a napkin and we could, we could place it on his lips and maybe we could get the tiniest morsel of a, because he can't chew, so maybe, maybe we just hold it on his lips. And so I'm just trying to think of how we're going to do this to still do communion. And so, and so I walk in the room. And then my mother-in-law and my wife lean over to my father-in-law and they say, Tom, your son-in-law is here and he's going to give you communion. At this point, he bursted his eyes open. And he began to try to sit up. It took him five minutes to get from this point to this point. But he fought with every muscle, every fiber in his body. He hadn't moved for over almost a week. And he fought just to sit up six inches. And he fought and he opened up his mouth. His tears were coming down and we're looking at him. Everybody's crying. He is fighting. What? Why was he fighting? He's fighting to give Jesus all the honor and all of the glory. With his last moments and his last breath. He didn't say, hey, how are those elections doing? He didn't say, hey, what are you guys going to do with my fishing rods? He didn't say, oh, let me do this, let me do, oh, there's a guy who owes me money back in Chicago. He didn't say that. He fought to take communion. He fought to honor the death of Jesus for his sins. He didn't fight anyone else. That didn't, none of that stuff mattered anymore. What only mattered to him, and the only thing he fought his energy for, was to give Jesus all the glory in his life. And that memory is imprinted in my head because I don't know many people that would fight to do that. I, I don't know many people that would muster strength just to give Jesus their last breath. Jesus gave you his would we do the same and do we do the same? For my father-in-law in that moment when he partook that bread and he partook that wine, he said more to everyone in that room about his life than you could ever write in a novel. You see, the word it is finished, it means something. And it meant something to him. And the Bible has other words. The Bible has other words like you're free. You're accepted. 
You're healed. You are loved. You are enough. You are alive. You are safe. You are home. And lastly, you are forgiven. Those are God's words over your life, over my life. As Jesus would honor you and I with his last words, could we honor Jesus with our life and our last words? You know, at this moment, I'm going to encourage you that right now as we partake in communion together, I'll tell you this, compared to my father-in-law, this will be the easiest communion you've ever taken. But it could really mean something to you. It could really be powerful to you. You may not be in the same circumstance, but you need the same blood. And today as we take this communion, it's a representation of the work of Jesus. And Jesus gave it to us just a few days earlier in that Passover. Jesus held up the bread and he held up the wine and he said, this bread represents my body that will be beaten, that will be pierced, and that will be marred for you. And he said, this wine represents my blood, which will be shed for you. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. Not remember anything else. We're meant to leave everything else behind. In the New Testament, Paul tells us that before we take this, we should scan our life. Look at our life and say, is there anything that I need to put on that cross? Is there anything I need to repent of? Is there anything I need to confess? And that moment is meant to be a moment between you and God that you partake. And so at this moment, I want to encourage you, all of you guys, could we stand on our feet? And if you don't feel comfortable taking communion today, it, 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 you don't have to if you don't want to. But for those who, this means everything to us. This isn't a toy, a snack. This isn't something to be played with. This is something that, at least for someone that I loved in my life, they fought everything to take this. Not because of what it was, but because of what it represented. And it represented that Jesus gave it all for you and I. And that word, it is finished. It does mean something today. So we're going to worship just a little bit. We're all going to leave here together. So I ask you to stay to the end of the service. But for about a minute, we're going to worship. And I encourage you to have a moment with the Lord. And whenever you're ready, partake in this during the worship. And we'll come back here and we'll leave together. So let's worship one more time together. Thank you. 
I want to encourage you, if you would join me right now with your head bowed and your eyes closed, and maybe just hear my words, but I'll, I'll make it simple as we go to leave here today, but Jesus makes it plain in the Gospels, and he says this, he said, if you would deny me before man, there will come a day that I will deny you before my Father, and so there is an opportunity zone to receive the work of Jesus. And the opportunity ends the day we close our eyes. The day that we die, the opportunity to receive Jesus is over. The work of Jesus and the cross is for this life. There will be a life to come and the resurrection comes on Sunday. But first we ought to die to self, repent of our sins, and fully cling to the work of the cross. The resurrection shows us that the cross worked. But the cross has to work in our life. We have to receive this work. So I just want to encourage you if in this place, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never allowed that one phrase, it is finished, to be ascribed to your life, and you put your faith in the work of Jesus, his death and resurrection, and you repent of your sins, doesn't mean that your life gets perfect. It doesn't mean that everything starts to piece together. What it means is you've recognized how much you need this sacrifice, how much you need salvation. That's what this represents. It represents being born again because of the work of Jesus. One day, all of us will stand before God and we'll have to answer for how we lived on this earth. But either as you stand before God, Jesus can say, oh, I acknowledge them. I know this person because they received my finished work of the cross. Or he may say, I never knew you. Did you know me on earth? Because I, I, I didn't know you. So today is an opportunity that we can receive the work of Jesus in our life. So I just want to encourage you. If you want to receive that work in your life today, I won't do anything fancy right now. I, I, I won't count right now. We'll do that on Sunday. I just want you right now, if you need to receive that work for your life and either rededicate your life or either say this for the first time, I just want you to lift your hand up in the air right now. I just want you to lift your hand up high in the air. I will continue to lift it. We're going to keep our hands up. Give you an opportunity to receive it. I know I've lights on my eyes in this direction, but I do see hands all over. I want you, as you keep your hand up right now, we're all going to see, receive this prayer and say this prayer together. It's a prayer of affirmation of what the Holy Spirit is already doing. So as your hand is raised for those that are confessing Jesus as Lord, I just want you right now, would everyone join me in saying this out loud together? Can we say this? Dear Lord Jesus, in this moment, I repent of my sins. I believe in my heart that the work of the cross was for me. And I believe that you rose three days later 
And in this moment, I confess you as Lord and Savior. And I commit to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a hand clap to those that just responded to the work of God in their life? Here's what we're going to do together as we're all about to leave. Can we turn the house lights up just so that we can see everybody? They, they, they're, they're, I don't think there's an empty seat in this place pretty much. This is one of the most full Good Fridays we've ever had. Uh, we thank God that God is moving in our church today. And so uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you said that prayer today, I want to encourage you before you leave, we want to get you a resource. So if you said that prayer, rededicate your life, go to uh, www.grow. Dot faith. We want to come alongside of you again. We got three service times to choose from. Here's the thing. There's a rumor that it may rain on Sunday, okay? Don't let the rain make you lazy about your faith. Don't say you were going to go on Sunday until you saw a few drops. We got, we're working on overflow. It's, we're going to take care of you. Don't worry. If you didn't come the way of the courtyard, go outside the courtyard. We got some stuff representing Good Friday that you can see before you leave. But I'll pray for us. I'll bless you guys. We'll see you guys Sunday, 9, uh, 11, and 1 p.m. God, we thank you for this Good Friday today, God. We pray that you have been glorified in all that we did today. We give you all praise, honor in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. We'll see you Sunday.